The Japanese rising sun is hoisted up the flagpole of Los Angeles' City Hall. To the south at the large American naval base in San Diego, Japanese Imperial Navy officers oversee the conversion of a surviving American carrier into one to be crewed by Japanese sailors. A few hundred miles away, Japanese troops march nearly unopposed to seize Las Vegas and strategically important Hoover Dam, cutting off water and power to the entire American Southwest. This is how Japan could have brought the United States to its knees and won World War II. In our real timeline, the war between the United States and Japan was relatively short, but a brutal affair with combat spanning across the entire Pacific. While the confrontation has been typically portrayed as a battle between titans, the truth is that Japan was no match for the United States, even with half its attention diverted to Europe. Japan entered the war with 12 battleships, 13 carriers, 7 light carriers, 10 escort carriers, 18 heavy cruisers, 25 light cruisers, 169 destroyers, and 195 submarines. The US, on the other hand, started with 17 battleships, 7 carriers, 1 escort carrier, 37 heavy cruisers, 171 destroyers, and 112 submarines. The two fleets were fairly evenly matched at the start of hostilities, though Japan had a sizable advantage in one key area – carriers. These floating airfields were now the dominant weapon of naval warfare, though the world hadn't yet discovered the fact. Hence why the Japanese raid on Pearl Harbor was in effect a strategic failure. None of America's carriers were sunk or even damaged in the attack, and losses to battleships, cruisers, and destroyers did little more than simply slow the U.S. Pacific Fleet down. While Japan and the U.S. began the war on nearly level ground, by the end of the war there was no comparison. The United States was the most powerful navy the world had ever seen, with 23 battleships, an astonishing 28 carriers, 71 escort carriers, 72 cruisers, 377 destroyers, 361 frigates, and 232 submarines. Hundreds of aircraft launched from the decks of the largest carrier fleet ever assembled, as the U.S. Navy swallowed up the surviving members of the Japanese Imperial Navy. The staggering size of the U.S. fleet toward the end of the war is indicative of Japan's greatest challenge in overcoming its much larger opponent. America's industrial might was staggering and quickly brought to bear against its enemies. By comparison, the Japanese islands were not heavily industrialized, with manufacturing concentrated in a few key cities and much of the nations operating a cottage industry model where goods were created in homes or small neighborhood shops. The US, on the other hand, had invested millions into building sprawling transportation networks to haul goods and resources from one end of the country to the other, and its merchant navy fleet was one of the largest in the world. To make matters worse for Japan, the American population was nearly twice as large as Japan's, with Japan having just over 73 million citizens and the U.S. having over 133 million people to work farms, factories, docks, and shipyards all over the nation. But it wasn't just people that made America far stronger than Japan. It was its access to natural resources needed for fueling a massive wartime economy. The U.S. had plentiful access to rich oil deposits and, in fact, before the war was responsible for exporting much of Japan's critically needed petroleum and petroleum products necessary for heavy industry. Before the raid on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. had used threats of an embargo to attempt to curb Japanese expansionism in the Pacific before finally cutting off the oil supply entirely and leaving Japan in dire straits. As of that moment, the war was inevitable as Japan had to seize alternative sources of oil to power its military and industry both, and most of these sources would end up being British-controlled, which was all but guaranteed to drag the U.S. into war. But the U.S. was also rich in iron and other metals, as well as coal. The Japanese islands, by comparison, were relatively resource-poor and to finance the ever-growing empire, Japan had been forced to invade a weakened China. The goal was to convert China into a massive factory which would power Japanese expansionism across the Pacific. The Japanese empire leeching off China's abundant natural resources and manpower like a parasitic tick. Before the war between the US and Japan, America provided over 74% of Japan's scrap iron and 93% of its copper. In a very real sense, Japan ensured its own defeat by starting a war with America in the first place. Yet Japanese leadership felt they had no other choice. If they acquiesced to American demands, they would be forced to pull out of China and lose access to the natural resources which would make it independent from the US. The choice was grim, but a necessary one in the minds of Japanese military leadership, and it didn't help that it was also fueled by very skewed intelligence and opinions on the US. For one, America was believed to be fundamentally weak, a mongrel nation of mixed races and immigrants which would be unable to pull itself together in case of a war. Such diversity and lack of purity was seen as a weakness by both Japan and Nazi Germany. It was also believed that the Americans were poor soldiers and that civilian morale would crumble at the first sign of a military defeat. These false assumptions sealed Japan's fate and signaled the death knell for any imperialistic ambition. 
But what could Japan have done differently in order to win in the Pacific? Manchuria would take a long time to turn into the industrial powerhouse Japan dreamed of using to fuel its empire. And the conquest of the rest of China would take just as long. Militarily and industrially speaking, Japan was simply incapable of challenging the United States. Therefore, Japan would have to attack America directly in the first months of the war. While it had the advantage, and the US was reeling from Pearl Harbor, but an ordinary attack would not do. To eliminate America's industrial might, there was only one thing Japan could do – launch a full-scale biological campaign aimed directly at America's population. In our real timeline, Japan hatched a plan to launch a biological attack on California during the latter stages of the war. The plan was one of sheer desperation and would not have done anything to even moderately affect the American Pacific campaign. However, if such an attack had taken place at the start of the war, perhaps history would be a little different today. Call it a biological Pearl Harbor, and using the same tools Japan experimented with in our real timeline. Develop specifically to get close to well-protected US shores and launch attacks on coastal infrastructure. Special Japanese submarines were designed that could house a small number of planes within. Once near the US, these massive submarines, the largest ever built until nuclear ballistic missile submarines of the Cold War, would remove an outer shell to reveal a small flight deck from which fighter bombers could be launched. But these planes wouldn't be loaded with conventional explosives, rather they would carry deadly pathogens with one goal – unleash a plague in the US. Japan had a great deal of experience with biological warfare even before war with the US. The infamous Unit 731, or the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army, had been carrying out experiments with living humans, and these experiments involved some of the deadliest diseases in the world, including anthrax, bubonic plague, botulism, cholera, and smallpox. An estimated 500,000 prisoners of war, including some Americans and civilians, would all die at the hands of Unit 731, as Japan experimented on captives and dropped bombs laced with deadly pathogens in the heart of Chinese cities. To prepare for for an attack on US cities, Unit 731 personnel had experimented with plague bombs. This foul procedure involved infecting many Chinese and allied prisoners of war with the plague, then harvesting their diseased flesh in vivisections conducted with no anesthetic. As one Unit 731 medical assistant recalled after the war, the Chinese fellow knew that it was over for him, so he didn't struggle when they let him into the room and tied him down. I cut him open from chest to stomach and he screamed terribly, and his face was all twisted in agony. He made this unimaginable sound. He was screaming so horribly. But then he finally stopped. This was all in a day's work for the surgeons, but it really left an impression on me because it was my first time. Thousands upon thousands of civilians and POWs were similarly processed across the Japanese prison camps, receiving no anesthetic because of Imperial Japan's deep belief that everyone that wasn't Japanese was an inferior race. So how could Japan use biological warfare to bring the US to its knees? In our hypothetical scenario, Japan realizes that to topple the US, it's necessary not just to destroy its naval forces, but to target its civilians so it cannot bring its industrial might to bear. This requires an attack using specialized submarines developed just for this task, with their fighter bombers loaded up with bombs containing all sorts of virulent plagues. These Aichi M6A Sirens have been specifically built for what's been dubbed Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. The planes will drop plague bombs in the heart of San Diego, Los Angeles, and Portland to begin with, but more attacks will follow. Supplementing the submarine-borne attack, Japan releases thousands of balloons also carrying plague bombs. These balloons will float over the Pacific on intercontinental air currents before falling over Canada and the US. In the real world, Japan released 10,000 such balloons carrying conventional and incendiary explosives, but managed to kill only six people. As Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night is put into motion, Japanese saboteurs across the US also go into action. These covert agents carry briefcases, which have been modified to spray deadly pathogens with the click of a button on the handle. In major cities across the US, these agents spray tens of thousands of unwitting civilians. They too will be poisoned by their own weapons, but such is the fanaticism of Imperial Japan that the agents consider it an honor to die in service of the Emperor. Carried out in conjunction with Pearl Harbor, the biological attack goes unnoticed at first. However, within days, the first victims are showing up in hospitals across the US, all with the same symptoms. Immediately, it's become clear the United States has been subjected to the greatest biological attack in human history and the federal government scrambles to come up with a national response plan. But the cities affected grow by the day. The incubation period means many people don't show symptoms for as much as a week, by which time they might have traveled to a different city altogether and infected others. 
panic spreads across the US as emergency quarantines are put into place. Victims begin to die by the thousands, fueling even more panic. Hospitals are overwhelmed immediately. Social services stretch to the breaking point. With the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US needs to rebuild its losses quickly and more. It needs tanks, armored trucks, and artillery for Europe, battleships, submarines, and aircraft carriers for the Pacific. But as workers rush to factories, they bring the deadly diseases with them. The death toll skyrockets, and the factories inevitably have to shut down, bringing American industrial power to a screeching halt. This buys Japan as much as a year to prepare itself for a confrontation with the US and secure additional vital resources. Ultimately, though, such a massive biological attack would be logistically impossible, and a limited attack against the West Coast, which is all that would be realistically feasible for Japan, would simply not be enough to stop the United States of America from steamrolling Imperial Japan. The cold hard truth is that there is no realistic scenario where Japan could have won World War II, and in fact the US could have lost every major battle of the war and still defeated Japan through sheer weight of numbers. Now go learn how World War II didn't end like you think it did, or click this other video instead.